You're listening to The Classroom Collaborative Podcast with your hosts, Dee Dee Wills Ed Brock And Adam Peterson Here we go We're so glad you're here Let's get started Hey everybody, welcome back to The Classroom Collaborative Podcast with me, Adam Peterson and Hi, I'm Dee Dee Wills And we are glad to be back with you all again If you hear an odd noise, Augie is going to town on one of his bones behind me <laughs> like just chewing up a storm and it's the loudest boat in the world But uh, it, it's his language of, of love with his toys, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. uh, how are you? You just said uh, you're going to get more snow today. Yeah, we're really good though. Um, yeah, we're good. Um, staying warm. We, um, are just kind of taking it day by day. Um, we actually went down and saw the perfect sun, um, on over the weekend. I we saw were, that, that looked awesome. We were supposed to, uh, go skiing, which is a perfect social distancing event, right? Because you're outside. <laughs> um, but because of all the snow they got and the weather they got in Texas, he had to work on Saturday. So um, I just, we couldn't wait anymore. I mean, I hadn't seen him in forever. He he and Annie both have had the virus. So we figured it probably, so we're, we're self-quarantining here at home, but um, we figured we're probably pretty safe as far as not getting it. Um, right. And, so anyhow, we just did the drive down there. Hey, turned around the next day and came back. So it was, it was really it? short, uh, really far. Um, I mean, it's an eight and a half hour car drive. So you did that in one day, or you stayed down there overnight? No, we went down. We we drove down, and then Harry's trying to get comfortable. We drove down and then um, stayed the night. Uh, spent the whole day Sunday with them, and then got up really early on on Monday and came home. Uh, That's awesome. I loved your, uh, were you decorating like cookies? Is that what you were doing with them? No, <laughs> it was not good. It was not good. It was fun. You know? It was like fun. It was always, it's always fun. Ours, ours started to look a little like what you would see in a kindergarten classroom by the time we were done. <laughs> like those, those from that show nailed it. You ever see that where they like try to copy a Pinterest cake? <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. Well, well I'm glad you had a good visit. That's good. Yeah, I am too. I'm glad we got to have that done, but I'm really excited about seeing you and having another discussion about all the things. Same. Good. Yeah, I think this is going to be a good discussion too. Um, I mean, uh, this is a good discussion anytime, but yeah, there are so many changes going on right now with, I keep seeing like all these teachers I follow, like I'm back in person. Now I'm back on virtual. Now I'm back on person. Now I'm back. So right. I think the article we found and the conversation we want to have is a great one for how to reach all kids Right. regardless of the type of atmosphere you're in right now, whether it's in person or virtual or hybrid, it's just, we, we want to make these kids seem as visible and heard no matter what type of language barrier there is. And that's kind of right. what we want to talk about today, how to support multilingual students in the early grades, but really any grade too, because this right. is going to be a, you know, there's going to be students at all grade levels. Right. Can you hear Augie eating his, his food? It's the well, loudest noise in the world. Edit. Um, yeah, you know, so this article is one that um, it gives five ways teachers can um, celebrate and extend um, linguistic expertise of young students who speak two or more languages. Um, and as I was reading through these suggestions, it reminded me to my teacher training days. So um, I received my teaching certificate in California. And in order to be a teacher in California, you have to have um, an ESL, basically an ES, I don't know what they call it anymore, ESL certificate. So um, uh, English is a second language certificate. So, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about different strategies to incorporate. But what we found is, and what I found when I moved to central Missouri, um, where we didn't really have um, ESL students, was what worked for ESL students also worked for students who had um, maybe a language-based difference or they didn't have very strong oral language or they had a hard time putting sentences together. So those are the types of things that we would incorporate these strategies as well. So whether you are in a school that has um, ESL students or not, you probably would want to use these regardless Mm -hmm. um, because it will benefit most of your students. Most of your students will have a benefit from this. And then especially those students who have, um, and either a second language or are having a, a uh, um, what I'm trying to say, 
I know what you're trying to say. I'm nodding like everybody's listening I, is going to understand. I, a sentence stands. But anyhow, it, it helps those students who have a language learning differences. Right. Well, can we just focus on the, the, the tagline there for a minute, too? For young students who speak two or more languages. I mean, that blows my mind to think. And I know there are kids out there that do. but And I can speak a tiny few words in Spanish. And I'm actually learning from one of my students I'm working with a little bit of Chinese. But to hear like students that are speaking two or more languages and yes. probably fluently, it just yes. blows my mind at the amount of knowledge that is out there in some of these little minds that we probably don't even think to tap into. Right, right. And we and we certainly want to encourage those students to not lose that language. Right. Um, I know that um, I've talked to several adults who um, came from a Spanish speaking home. Um, and then when they went into school, the parents really worked on learning English. And so, um, you know, Spanish wasn't spoken as much. And so their Spanish is really rusty. So, you know, if, and we know what a benefit that would be for any um, employee um, to have a second language right. or a third or a fourth. So we want to make sure that we encourage courage using their second language. So let's get to some of the strategies. Yeah, and I think I think tip number one, as I'm sitting here thinking of what you just said about having children at home or trying to think of it in the classroom, this incorporating children's home languages, I don't think there's ever been a better year to do this than if you're a virtual teacher, right? Because yeah. chances are someone in the home is there. And while you're not going to spend your entire lesson with that one-on-one -on -one child, if you have the, you know, if you have the lucky opportunity to do that, um, what I'm getting at here is I am working with a one-on-one -on -one student uh, who lives in New York and speaks English, but at home they speak Chinese as well, Mandarin Chinese. And um, he, grandma is there with them. She lives in the home. And if if mom is at work or mom's busy at home, grandma will sometimes jump on the calls or or kind of sit next to him and help him because he's only four years old. And um, it's so fascinating to hear, like if I say something or she tries to redirect him, she does it in Chinese. So that was an instant. I'll never forget. Like one of the first times I heard, I said, Teddy, what, what did your grandma say to you? And, and he said, she said something in Chinese. I said, well, let's talk about this. And he got to teach me a little bit. So each time we get together, he teaches me, you know, a couple words and I cannot remember them for the life of me, but he'll teach me a couple words. Hello. Goodbye. Hi. We've been doing some counting in Chinese, which fascinates me because he just looks at me like, come on, man, say it, you know? So I think if you're a virtual teacher, Trying to incorporate that now could be could be huge. You know, having some of your students on screen talk or bring their families on and try to teach the whole class some. And I mean, when when we can do that, it makes children feel so proud of that that ability that they have. Right. The article says that thinking and sharing in both of the languages solidifies their learning. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, what we would want to do, how this would maybe look in your classroom, is if you had two students who had the same home language or a same base language, allow them time to talk in their own language, right, to talk about the con whatever concept you're working on, and then have them also work on it in English so that they have a chance to share both of those um, languages. Um, well, let's imagine that you're in a classroom and you don't have any students who speak anything but English, Right. Um, we still want to make sure that that talk is taking place because, again, that really does – language does solidify learning. So mm -hmm. if you have students who all speak English, um, give them an opportunity to talk to each other again about whatever concept you're working on so that they can have some solid um, understanding of that. Yeah, and, and unfortunately in today's world, that's a little bit harder, right, like to, to do those turn-in talks yeah. in a virtual classroom. Right. But I think – I think, and, and this is just me from following social media and reaching out to teachers and seeing what's going on. I feel like we're on the upswing of going back to school. Um, I know there's some places where it's still 100% virtual, but right. um, I think now more than ever, what you just said is going to be tremendously important. Like when these kids are getting back into a classroom, but they haven't been all year long, just give them some time to talk, right? Like just let right. them chat with each other. And I'm not talking for the whole language of it, but just for – you know, just for that social, emotional, and, and behavioral, and all that brain research that goes into language, right. just give them some time to chit-chat with each other, because they're going to need it to socialize. And we did do a little article, or not article, an episode, the words episode, Didi, that um, we talked about um, virtual hangouts. So you can do yeah. a hangout where you have two students, breakout is the word I'm looking for. Oh, yeah. breakout. You want to do breakout. 
So you can put two two or three students in a breakout session, and then they can have a discussion. And you as the teacher, if you are doing this virtually, you know, you can pop into those rooms and kind of eavesdrop into those. Not eavesdrop. I think your your presence is known when you're there. Right. But, um, you know, make sure that you're kind of monitoring the, that discussion. I think it's a great way to um, – Try to do that several times. Try to do that several times a day. I know that time is so precious right. on a virtual platform, but having that would be a great way to, um, you know, take it a little bit deeper. I know um, whether it's one on one or small group. There, there's a couple of teachers I've had the opportunity to chat with recently. One of them we're going to be getting on the podcast pretty soon. Our friend Leanna, but I was talking to her last night on an ESGI live and. She had mentioned that they're, they were full day virtual for a long time. They just went back to school in person last week, I believe. Yeah. But um, they had a schedule set in place by their district that they had to follow that left time in the afternoon um, for her to be able to do some small group work. So she said she scheduled out her week with the parents using Sign Up Genius or something. And instead of just doing a full class Zoom or Google Meets every single day in the afternoon, she she broke them out into groups. And she would do a group of four and they knew that on Monday it was their turn to meet from, I don't know, I'm just making up times from 12 to 1230, right? And and on Tuesday it was their turn to meet from three to four, whatever it may be. But I thought that was a great idea. Like, yes, if we're going to still have to teach full time, let's kind of treat it like a classroom. You know, we're going to work with those students in small groups in a classroom anyway. Right. And then I got to witness this yesterday because Trisha was working from home yesterday afternoon. And I knew she was kind of doing, I mean, so Trisha's teaching a hybrid model. So she has students in the morning virtual in the afternoon, some that are completely virtual all day long. It's insane. I don't know how she's doing it, but she started offering. Um, so I think it was, she was in her classroom and she was talking about how one of her virtual students, she was going to meet with them this afternoon on a Google meets call. And one of her students that's in person said, well, when I'm at home in the afternoon, can I do that too? And she said, all these kids like started asking like, can I meet with you on the computer? Can I talk to you on the computer? So she started scheduling time in her afternoon to just do like, 15, 20 minute calls with her students right. one-on-one. And she's like, they look so forward to that, that time where they can just sit, you know, without a mask on at home and chat with their teacher and just, just talk. And she said, the kids have loved it. And it's so fun to see their personalities come out when they're doing, you know, they get to just be them at home and they're one-on-one and they're asking her questions and she just gets to talk. And I got to see it yesterday afternoon. She was sitting here at the table talking to some of them and it was, it was cool to see, like just, how excited they were to talk to their teacher, right? Like, in, in, I, I, think, I mean, classroom community is the reason why I think most teachers teach, right? Is right, that exactly. When you, when you haven't had the opportunity to build that relationship the way you normally would, um, it, it sort of is, I mean, nobody does this for the pay, right? Right. <laughs> for the glory. So, um, you know, having, having an opportunity to sneak that in, in a way, um, it sounds wonderful. I, it, um, it was cool to see. Yeah, really good. Second te- um, uh, thing that they wanted us to say, I can't believe I have a podcast. Yeah. I- <laughs> Let's just, you know, every teacher listening right now totally feels the way that you're talking. <laughs> They're like, you've been forgetting words all year long. Left-hand side, this is my right hand, or right hand, or right hand. Okay. <laughs> Teach anchor words um, was another strategy they said. So make a list of that, re- um, that relevant thematic words and uh, pre-teach them. Um, to students who are your multilingual learners. So, um, you know, I think, I think oftentimes we would do some of those things, um, in some vocabulary. It depends on what kind of lesson you're working on. If you're working on a lesson that is teaching them to decipher a word in, in context, that kind right. of vocabulary lesson, then you may not want to do that. You want them to read the sentence around there and infer the meaning and then check, check for understanding. However, if you're doing content learning and you're wanting to know about, um, I can only think of the word echolocation, right? But if you want to talk about echolocation or um, oviparous or you want to talk about carnivores versus um, herbivores, right. you know, teach those, um, you know, kind of pre, preload those anchor words. So um, I think I, it's hard sometimes for us to do that. One thing, there you go. One thing I I think about as I'm reading this that, we forget sometimes too that not just with students with a, a language barrier, but sometimes new students who have moved from another part of the country with things like this, right? Like, so they use the terms like farm in here. There are some students who have probably never ever seen a working farm before, right? So right. I know I'm using that example because our town is a farming community. 
Right. And I think about students who might have moved from a bigger city or whatnot and and why they might not have a language barrier. Sometimes the anchor words were or the words that we're just assuming every child knows at five right. years old. They're looking right. at you like, I don't know. I don't know what that means, man. Well, they, right? have, so, they have a semi understanding of what it yes. means, right? They have like, oh, I've heard that word. I've heard it before, but I really don't understand what does it mean? You know, he farmed the land. Well, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, I know what a farm is, but what does it mean to farm the land? Or, you know, some of those types of nuances of language that they may not have had the experience with. Um, I also think that there's lots of different types of farms, right? There's, right. Um, you know, there's there's also, you know, a solar farm and there's also, mm-hmm. you know, so there's or, or a wind farm. And so those are just sort of different ways in which maybe maybe students who only have the perspective of, you know, the cow, the sheep and the pig farm. And when they hear the words of a solar farm, they may not or a wind farm, they may not have right. um, the ability to make that connection between this word and that. Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, it's one of my favorite things I started doing in my classroom. And I guess it wasn't really for that purpose of the, the, the anchor word. I guess it was anchor words. I just never really referred to it that was I did mine kind of seasonally. So we had our word wall that was our, our high frequency words that we taught. But then in our writing center, I had another, I don't know what we even called it. Just we could call it a word wall, right? But I had a, a chart in our, our writing center that was on a magnet board and I put up magnets with words that kind of went along with that season right. or current unit of study. Right. And, right. and I saw some writing really take off. Like, so, you know, in the spring we had words up about, you know, plants and flowers and the holidays that were in the spring and, and, you know, gardening and all kinds of stuff that there's words up there, but the kids started to incorporate those into their writing. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. And if we can do that, for students who either A, have a language barrier or B, speak more than one language, how fun would it be to add in words that they recognize or, you know, and, and, and tie that all together so they can help teach each other? Right, right. Yeah, I have always, always had a, I had a writing center that I put out like probably my first year on TPT. <laughs> I, I revised it like 72 times. Um, so, and it's, so, but it is, was one of the ones that, Teachers say has been one of their favorite things and, and students always loved going there. It was one of those things you set it up that writing center. If you keep swapping out the materials to keep them fresh, it makes it, it makes it, um, something that they want to go back to again and again. Right. All right. So the next one we have is provide sentence stems, which, um, if those of you who are not familiar with, with what that means, I know you're familiar with what it is when I tell you. It's like, you know, <laughs> if you're, uh, asking them, to respond about an opinion, um, you may you may have some different types of, of stems, like my favorite part was, or I think that, blah, blah, blah. So you provide that structure for them, and then they can um, really focus on what they want to say, not necessarily how they have to put that sentence together. Does that make right. sense? No, totally. And I feel like I'm doing this so much right now with my little. So I know we kind of talked beforehand that I, I have, I'll be honest, I haven't had a lot of experience with multilingual students. Um, it's just, just where I live and where I taught. I didn't have that opportunity. I mean, I had some students that, you know, spoke Spanish at home, but they spoke English fine at school. Right. Um, and some that went to ESL, but it wasn't really a big part of our population. Um, right. But right. in my current role, and I think a lot of our primary teachers can relate to this, um, I'm working with three-year-olds. I have two little three-year-old girls who come to see me simply to work on language development and That's social play. And really just taking turns, that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like I, I'm doing this just naturally. I think all teachers do. We provide this. Think of it as like your prompts for journal writing, but it's your prompt for spoken language, right? right. So right. I know with my two little three-year-olds, I'm constantly doing this, these little girls. I mean, they will babble and babble and babble, but to really get them to focus on a topic, I'm doing sentence stems all day long with them when I see them. I think, and I think that there's, um, it, it suggests having um, a few of them. Um, and then teach them consistently. So I also think that you can have some sentence stems that work for um, having a discussion. So mm-hmm. um, if if you're having two students talk about something, you know, this, having that accountable talk stem is something that can also be incorporated. Like, I heard what you said, Adam, and I'd like to add on, right? Like those right. Kind of little, little sentence stems are things that – are things that we would want to teach all year long um, and then um, have them 
be reinforced. Um, I had a student um, that comes to mind my last year in the classroom who had a huge oral language processing issue. Um, and so she would put sentences together that were not um, following, you know, a the way, the way they say things. Right. She would put words in the wrong area. So we really, really worked on, um, you know, a few sentence stems that would help her to kind of organize her thoughts. We did lots of different things, but that was one of the things that was really helpful for her was to have some sentence stems that she could always go back to to Mm -hmm. get her started. Because it was sort of like she would have a hard time getting started, like she wouldn't really know how to um, launch a sentence um, orally. And of course, if they can't do it orally, it's not going to happen in writing either. So. Right. Well, I, I think that the, one of the sentences in there that really stuck out to me and as I was reading this article, I'm like, gosh, I, I did this, but I could have done it better. I, I didn't do this, but I should have done this, right? Like things that you don't, and probably I didn't really think about when I was in kindergarten because I didn't have a, you know, a giant population of multilingual students, but there was a line that I thought was great doing this type of stuff helps children focus on what they want to say rather than thinking about how to formulate their response. Right. If we can help them with that formulation of their response and get that part out of the way, number one, it takes a lot of nerves off of them if they're someone who's not comfortable speaking, but it puts the focus on on what do you really want to get out? Like, tell us what's on your mind. And and it allows the students to do that. I thought that was a really good sentence and a good point there. I agree. I agree, Adam Peterson. I agree. I agree. Um, I agree with you, Adam, and I'd like to add on. Uh, so also to incorporate visuals. So that was another strategy is to incorporate mm-hmm. visuals with new vocabulary, try acting out new vocabulary words. Um, I think, I think like in, in our world today, it seems like it's more, uh, more easier. It's easier to do that because right. we have the internet. We have so many different um, technology tools that allow us to not only have students act out a word, but also let's let's take a look at what this looks like. You know, we don't have yeah. to actually go look it up in a book um, in the Encyclopedia Britannia. That was a thing. Those of you who are listening, it was a thing. Um, I mean, you can you can Google this stuff. So um, it's really nice that you can have different visuals. You can, if you're an artist, you can draw those things. You can grab an image off a of Google image to kind of make those um, vocabulary words a little bit more concrete. You do need to be mindful of what you're, what you're showing. Um, um, because again, oftentimes there's multiple meanings to a word, right? And so how we might be using it. Um, in this particular instance, might be different than how it's used in another. Um, I can think of the word bark, you know, like bark. There's a bark on a tree. There's a dog that barks. Um, don't bark at me. Um, so there's lots of different um, nuances to language, right? So, you know, as you're talking about today, we're talking about the bark on the tree and this is what it looks like and, you know, blah, blah, blah. However, you know, you probably heard dog barks and other people barking orders at somebody, you know, so, um, you know, you, you can layer in those multiple meanings there. Um, I have a squirrel who's doing Olympics out here on my patio. Okay. So, you know, basically because we have multilingual uh, or multi meaning words out there, you know, we, we might want to drop in a little, you know, there's more than one use of this word but today we're talking about this particular one right um, the example think, they had in the oh, i'm sorry go ahead no go finish that thought because i don't want to so, the article that they had they were talking about you know the difference between rubbing something and scrubbing something i think was the, was the example and i think that that is something you know those types of um synonyms um are really great for acting out right so, and you could take one word of like cleaning and add all of those other words that are, you know, dusting. What does that look like? What does scrubbing look like? What does sweeping look like? Um, those types of things um, can help expand vocabulary as well. Well, I think visuals are such an awesome way to, I mean, if you're trying, number one, expanding vocabulary, just to get kids to talk too, to get kids to say yeah. what's on their mind or what they're thinking. And yeah. there's a there's a site that um, our friend Lori Elliott told me about called photosforclass.com. Uh huh. Oh, so okay. Yeah, it's it's a cool. So it's a it's a Creative Commons site where you just search to download properly. It says download properly attributed Creative Commons photos for school. 
So all images are age appropriate. There's automatic citations to them. They are Creative Commons photos. And I mean, you can just type in a, a topic, right? Like let's say, let's use that word washing or scrubbing or farm, like we had said, and you'll find different photos. And I know she had mentioned using it like in a virtual classroom just to kick off the day. Like, tell us what you see or let's talk about what's on your mind or what do you think right. about what's happening in this photo or what do you yeah. see? Yeah. And I think that's such a great way just to, to get kids to open up, right? I know. Um, I guess not intentionally in my classroom right now, but because I see so many different age levels, I'm working with kids that are three year olds up to seven year olds. Right. And um, not so much a visual, but one of my seven year olds and I are working really on strong reading skills. And so we'll have we'll have words all over the board in my room that we've been working on. And, and he's marking them to 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 work on sentence dictation and not. And one of my little boys walks in. And he goes, what is all that information about up there? And this is one of my four year olds. And I was like. <laughs> That's a big word, buddy. What do you mean? And he's like, all those words and letters, it's a lot of information. And it was cool to see while that wasn't a visual I specifically put out for him, it brought out an interest in him that I, I, it was cool because he's like, well, let's go look for stuff. And he started looking for letters that he knew in all those giant words and sentences I had up there. And then I've got like, um, like play based pictures to lay out our schedule for my three year olds. Like now it's time to do our story. Now it's time to do our, and while my older students don't need that, they constantly are like, what's that picture for? Or are we going to do that today? And they'll, they'll look at those different things around my classroom. And it's really cool to think about. I mean, it really is. And, you know, if you think about how, if we think about multiple intelligences, we have some students who are really good with the auditory, some are visual. Um, I'm definitely a visual learner. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, I'm able to, I take pictures in my mind all the time. Um, and so, you know, and oftentimes, you know, even though I know I'm a visual learner, um, I have to remind myself not to be an auditory teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes that's what we do. We talk and talk and talk and talk versus show, 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 show. So I love right. that incorporate, incorporate visuals. Um, last tip that they had was layering questions, mm -hmm. which is basically varying the different ways in which you ask questions. Um, I was taught it was called scaffolding. You scaffold your instruction right. uh, and you will um, basically same idea of a layering, right? One level goes up and then the next level, the next level, the next level. Oftentimes we can't start up here. We can mm -hmm. get there if we make sure we do that work going up there. So um, varying the types of questions that we ask students. Um, this says that we are going to ask students who are multilingual um, different questions. Or mm, I, I, The way I read the article, it said making sure that you asked very types of questions to your multilingual students. And I would say I would say that we need to do that for all of our students. Yes, I was going to um, say, too. That's, I knew that's where you were going, but I don't want to interrupt you. But but it totally is. I knew you were going to take a long time to get there. <laughs> yeah, we need to do that for all of our students. So uh, yeah, that's I, I keep going back to my, my classroom right now. And again, I don't have multilingual students with my small group that I'm working with. But I do have one little boy who is three and n only babbles. Like they brought him to me to work on play, but he was also... I don't know if it was That's mutism or what, but he just, speech everything, delay. yeah, he's got a huge speech delay. Oh. Um, so everything is just me saying it over and over and layering these. So it's, it's, you know, can you, uh, and he loves to play, you know, that game, let's go fishing where the little fish pop in and out of the pond, but he just likes to put them in and out. And so we're working on taking turns. So we're, we're laying them out and you're like, can you find the red fish, but then put in the blue fish, but point. So, so he'll look at me and kind of say, okay, point to, the red fish, then point the, put the red fish in the pond. So we're really building up how he can do things to follow, you know, multi-step directions. When I think about layered questions, that's, that's something we do every single day. We, we yeah. use multi-step directions for students all the time, which can be layered questions. Right. And just be mindful that your students who are, um, acquiring English, um, might need to have that more than everybody else, but I'm going to, probably guarantee there is somebody in your class who English was their first language that needs it also. Oh yeah. Um, there's definitely going to be, so it's going to be helpful for everyone. Just be mindful that um, your multilingual students really need it and everybody else is going to benefit for it. Now we don't want to do for students things that they can do themselves. Right. Um, but um, I think 
varying those questions um, is a great way to kind of build for deeper understanding. I think the the last sentence here kind of says exactly what you said. And if we don't if we don't focus on multilingual students here, but we we focus on the child as a whole, the last sentence of the article says, when you vary your questions based on what you know about your children, it empowers them to express their thinking, extend their knowledge and be active members of the classroom community. And I think while this was focused on multilingual students, that is kind of what we try to do all the time anyway, when we talk about community and our students, when we can really focus on what we know about these children, that's yeah. going to evoke them to want to share more. I agree. I agree. I thought it was a great article. So we'll leave the article um, in the show notes so you can come back and watch it. Um, I'll put a link in for the website that Adam mentioned. And um, if you're right. watching on the computer, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook, Harriet is is done for the day. So, I mean, it's early and she's already taken a nap. Augie is too, right? Augie's out in his bed right there. Augie, peace out, people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the right way because it's opposite of what I think. But anyhow, <laughs> you guys have a great day and um, we'll see you next time. See you, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening to the Classroom Collaborative Podcast. If you are enjoying these episodes, please make sure that you subscribe wherever you are finding them. And share and rate it so others can find it as well. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.